-hmm. Good. All right. Uh, can you guys hear me in the back? Yes, great. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. I think this is a fantastic thing that you guys are doing. And uh, you know, I hope that uh, next year and the year after that, so you keep growing and growing and growing, okay? So what I will uh, tell you today uh, is a few things. Number one, I just want to tell you a bit about myself, a bit about how I ended up here in the US and how I ended up doing uh, basic biomedical research, which is what we do in the lab. Uh, next, I want to tell you a scientific story. Uh, and you're going to have to sort of maybe bring back some of those memories from your biology class. So I will tell you a few things about biology, mostly conceptual though, but I really want you to, to understand what we do in the lab and why we think that is important. Uh, and number three, I only have like one or two thoughts about science in Peru that might be you know, good to discuss after lunch, during lunch. Okay, so who am I basically? And is that, okay, perfect. That's me, I'm from Arequipa, Peru, there you go. So as you know, I had to get my own passport to come here several years ago. Very proud of that. I still have that. All right. See, this is why this, this, this is a good part, so you guys can get that. Uh, so how did I become a scientist? That's my, that's my father. Uh, my father, Francisco, he's an onion farmer in Arequipa. So we have farms, and I spend a lot of time in the farm, and you know, that's what he does. He still works at the farm. He's 74 years old. Uh, and, uh, you know, just watch him work uh, and be fully committed to his work was some, one of the things that I think has inspired me in terms of just, you know, having the tenacity to continue uh, uh, pursuing something that you really want to do. So in my background, my family background, there was obviously no scientists, very few engineers. There was a few doctors, yes. But as far as why I decided to become a scientist, there wasn't really an obvious reason. When you talk to many successful scientists, they tell you, oh, you know, they have this eureka moment in which, when I was six years old, my cousin had pancreatic cancer. And you know, these are beautiful stories. I don't have one like that. I just simply became a scientist because uh, I liked science from the very early on. So I spent my primary and secondary school in Arequipa. And then I did uh, one year of medical school in Arequipa. And at that time, I was already thinking that what I wanted to do was something very basic. Uh, you know, basically every time that I read the newspapers, the scientists discovered X and X, and scientists thought that there could be a new possibility, a new way of treating X and X. I was just incredibly excited about that. And you know, this was back in 1996, um, 95, so globalization wasn't really there. So it was a bit early for that. So obviously, uh, it was a bit of a difficult time for me to actually get access to universities in the US, but nevertheless, you know, this happened. Uh, I was able to get a scholarship, and I came uh, to the United States. So uh, I did my bachelor's at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, and I still remember the, the time that uh, uh, I got a job in a lab my first summer there. It was, you know, tremendously exciting. That's the first time I picked up a pet. I didn't have any background in, 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 in science in Peru. Uh, and I loved it, and ever since then, since 1997, I've been basically working in, in biomedical research since then. So I did a couple internships then, UCSF, University of Washington. After that, I went to Houston, where I got my PhD at uh, Baylor College of Medicine in cell and molecular biology. Um, after that, in a biomedical research track, after you get your PhD, you do what is typically called a postdoc, which is basically a specialization in somebody else's lab. I was a bit fortunate and maybe a bit too, too much of a risk taker, and I did something a bit different. I became a fellow, which basically I decided to have my own lab right after graduate school, and this happened actually right across the street at the Whitehead Institute of Biomedical Research, which is on Main Street, basically one block that way. It's also affiliated with MIT. So I was there for about four years. I established a research group there, and in 2009, I moved to a, a Children's Hospital, which is where my lab is. And I also have a full affiliation with Harvard University, and I teach classes at Harvard College, just down the street on Massachusetts Avenue. So that's who we are. So we are uh, a basic biomedical research lab. We are located at Children's Hospital in, in, in Boston. Uh, we're a group of about uh, 16 to 20 people uh, from undergraduates, Harvard undergraduates, to uh, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, medical fellows that work under me. 
And you know, we try to do a few things. So we, we study basically two main things in our lab. The number one question is, how is it that some of our tissues, our epithelial tissues, such as your liver, your skin, your lung, your gut regenerates and maintains itself? And uh, we also study uh, how your blood is produced, right? So how that massive production of red cells, platelets, uh, cells of your immune system occurs, and how that is controlled properly so you don't have anemias or problems with production of those cells and or problems with the overproduction of the cells, which are leukemias and lymphomas, okay? So that is what we do. All right, so let me t let's talk a bit about science. And I, I, I'm fully aware that the audience today is not full biologists. Actually, probably the minority of you guys are biologists, so I will be very, very happy if at the end of my talk, when we talk during lunch, you tell me that you at least got the main idea and the main message behind this, okay? Perfect. Great, so let me tell you about one very interesting biological question that fascinated me whenever I started working on this and why we think this is actually relevant. And this is the issue of organ size, okay? So if you think about it ourselves as humans and if you think about different animal species, right, every organ has a unique proportion, correct? Our liver has a similar, has the same proportion to our body weight, right, in every individual basically, right? The same with our kidneys. Our left kidney is the same size as our right kidney. Our left hand, the same size as the right hand, right? So we still do not understand, this is one of the major mysteries in biology, we still do not understand how is it that organ size is regulated? How is it that your organs stop growing once you reach a certain age? And I'll give you a couple of interesting examples here, right? Uh, I'll just focus on this one uh, for, for, for this audience. So liver transplants, you know, this is done, does something that is done clinically quite often. If you say you transplant, if, you, if I get my liver transplanted into, say, Shaquille O'Neal, who's a very large basketball player, so what will happen is that my liver will go into that patient and it will actually naturally start growing, right? And it will stop growing once it reaches the size of a liver that that person, Shaquille O'Neal, needs. And the opposite is true as well. If I get Shaq's liver into my body, obviously we're very big, but then naturally over the next several weeks, the liver is going to actually shrink and become basically my own liver size according to my dimensions, okay? So it's a very clear and very potent set of mechanisms that actually control and actively control size. So this is the question that we wanted to address molecularly. So, I highlight here some of the questions, conceptually, right, that my lab studies. Again, how do organs stop growing? And you can also take the same question, right, how does regeneration stop? And you can take a very simple idea, which is, you know, you, do a, you cut yourself in the finger, okay? So your body then recognizes that there's a gap of tissue in the middle, right, and then it clearly assesses this, and then it says, okay, we need to close this gap. And in order to close this gap, these cells here need to start proliferating, your epithelial skin cells need to start proliferating, migrating across that wound, right, filling in that wound on top, and then stopping that proliferation, stop growing anymore, right, because the wound is closed, the cells need to stop, right? So these signals to stop also are at play in terms of regeneration. Okay? Liver regeneration is also very, very interesting, but you can take three quarters of your liver away, the liver then will grow, and it will stop growing once it reaches those initial dimensions. Okay? So these very basic mechanisms are at play. So in my lab, we try to study what are the genes, what are the pathways, what are the molecules, what are the biochemical cascades that actually control these things, and I guess some of these other questions, right? How is it that these needs for growth basically are translated to the cells within your organisms, to those stem cells within your organisms that then tells them to grow or not to grow? Okay? All right. So today what I'll do is I'll tell you very briefly about one set of genes and proteins and mechanisms that work doing this and how is it that we've been able to harness that knowledge and at this point make some sort of small molecules that potentially want to turn into drugs for cancer. Okay, 
The other thing that I want to point out is that there are individuals with problems in, in growth control. Okay? So these are, for instance, a couple of images of, uh, oops. Uh, this is the elephant man, a very famous uh, person in England, I believe, which had this issue in which his basically mesenchymal tissue kept growing and growing, right? And this is a, 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 a patient now that has Proteus syndrome in which, again, his leg bone tissues actually keep growing and growing. So interestingly, what happens is that these patients also have a very high risk of malignancy of developing cancer. So this is something that made us thought that these intrinsic mechanisms that actually control symmetry and growth are also important for cancer, okay? All right, so let's skip that one. Okay, so how does this story start? And this is actually a very interesting and fascinating thing, I think, for you guys to think about. This is not our data, but I'll just tell you because this is how I got into this, this idea. So people in science study multiple model organisms, right? One of them being the fly. And it's not, it's not those nasty flies that we have in Arequipa, at least those big black ones that are very dirty. They study the fruit fly, right? Very cute and tiny ones that people have been able to you know, use genetic manipulation and, and, and all sorts of technologies to actually look at the genes in those flies. And why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because several years ago, many fantastic other scientists using flies and making mutations in those flies, they identified some flies that carry some mutations in some of those genes that had these very weird phenotypes. You can see this guy, right? That's a normal fly's head, and this other fly's head is just messed up entirely, right? The tissue is completely overgrown, right? And this other one here has the opposite effect. The tissue is actually very small. The eyes here cannot grow properly, okay? And this wing, for instance, this activation of this other gene gave him a massive wing. So from work done in this basic model system in the fly, people identify these genes and they put them together in this sort of uh, pathway that we called, and they say this set of genes can actually control the size of organs, right? That was the idea, the hypothesis. So when I was at the Whitehead Institute, we, we, we took this knowledge in the fly and say, hey, is this mechanism, is this set of genes also at play in us, in humans, and mice, obviously, which is one of the models that we use extensively in the lab. So I'll tell you just a few set of uh, 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 concepts about this, and then I'll move on to the more sort of translational part, very briefly. Great, okay, perfect. So interestingly, Drosophila geneticists are famous for putting funny names to their genes. And this whole pathway was called the hippo pathway. Hippo because hippos are massive and grow, right? So my lab works on the hippo pathway, and we have been very successful in, trying, in understanding what this pathway does, what are the genes that control this pathway, and what this pathway tells us about how we regenerate and how cancer grows. And that's, that's uh, what we do. So one interesting idea that we have on the pathway, and you know, we've confirmed at the gene and protein level, is that crowding is important, right? In cells, at least. You can imagine a cell that is by itself, right? It has a space, it has no neighbors, it has rooms to grow. But a cell that is very, very packed, imagine a thousand people in here, we're gonna be very, very packed. So we have a different reaction. Something similar happens with cells. And just molecularly, very cl clearly, right, these are cells that are very, very packed. You can see that basically hole in the middle, right, this is sustaining for this one particular protein that I will tell you about in a second. That protein is not in the nucleus of the cells, right, that is the hole. But in cells that are basically by, by, them, by themselves, that are not very packed, you can see that sort of round red dot, indicating that, that those cells has this active protein inside. So in a bunch of other experiments, we have also shown, and we do a lot of experiments in mice, right? And we do these experiments to actually prove an idea. The idea here was that this pathway, this set of genes controls the size of organs. And we've made some transgenic mice, for instance, in which the livers express this particular gene called YAP, which is an important gene that, that we study. And if you have more of those genes, your liver is about five to six times as large, right? Very strong evidence that this is probably a very strong regulator of proliferation. And what we have discovered is that this particular pathway, this hippo pathway, is the most important set of genes that control how your liver grows, regenerates, and proliferates. Okay, so let me skip a few things here. 
So I'm not gonna go into detail about this, but this is kind of what we look at, right? This is, every single one here is a protein, and these proteins work together. They work together, they touch each other, they play each other in your cell, they signal to each other, right? And they tell your cell to proliferate or not, basically, okay? So, and you can imagine the multiple things regulate this response, and I'll tell you a bit more about those. But the only thing I wanna to say to you, and I've mentioned the name of this guy again, is this protein called YAP, okay? And the take home message for you is that when YAP is not in the nucleus, then your cell is not proliferative, right? Your cell does not grow. And there are mechanisms that do that normally, right? So normally those mechanisms are keeping that protein YAP outside of the nucleus of your liver cells. Otherwise your liver will keep growing and growing and growing. In certain instances, for instance, Physiologically, right, if, you, if somebody takes three quarters of your liver out surgically, then those mechanisms somehow get shut off, YAP goes into the nucleus of the cells where it's active and activates genes, and those genes allow for ex proliferation and expansion of those cells normally, right? So that's the physiological function of this HIPAA pathway, and that's what we study in the lab. So again, I've shown you one, one picture of what this pathway does. Uh, just very, very quickly, because I don't have a lot of time to show you. This is in the skin, for instance, right? If you have more YAP, I'm sorry, this is less YAP, that's a normal skin, right? Multi-layer skin, stem cells and mature cells in the skin. If you have no YAP, your skin is much, much thinner. You lose basically all the cells, your stem cells exhaust. If you have more YAP, this is reversed, that's a normal skin. If you have more YAP, your skin massively grows, right? So, and our work for several years has now basically concluded that the more YAP that you have, the more active your stem cells are, okay? And I will sort of end with that. I'll skip that. So this is sort of conceptually the idea that maybe you just wanna think about this, right? So this pathway controls size, and the main driver of this pathway is a protein called YAP, okay? I think that's, that's the bottom line. The one thing that is very important that I wanna highlight before I move on to sort of the cancer part of my, uh, my story, oops, is that normally your tissues do not require YAP, right? So your intestine that is regenerating right now, your skin that is regenerating right now, does not require this gene. But if you injure your skin, if you take a piece out, if you injure your gut, you do require this protein. So all this set of genes that I've told you about, they are part of a molecular machinery, a set of genes that only are mostly relevant during regeneration. And this is important, right? Because if you wanna target a set of genes in cancer, we know what happens with chemotherapy, right? Chemotherapy kills most of our dividing cells. That's why there's so many side effects. This particular set of genes normally are not required, right? They're required during development, but not in the adult. So we think it could be a good drug target, right? Because this, it's only required during regeneration, and as I'll show you, it's important in cancer as well. Let me skip that. So just to summarize, a lot of the work that we and others have done over the last several years, so this HIPPO pathway, oops, I'm sorry. This HIPPO pathway is important in multiple, ooh, multiple aspects of cancer. Survival of cancer cells, migration, metastasis of these cancer cells, uh, protects the cells from death and obviously makes them proliferate, right? So from all these sets of data, we and others have thought that targeting this set of this gene, this YAP gene, is, is important for cancer. And, you know, we have lots of evidence, again, in mice, that if you simply activate this gene YAP, you get massive liver tumors, as you can see here, right? And if you turn it off, when we're showing you this data, then you can actually rescue the growth and you stop cancer growth. So that's basic biology, right? So that's a lot of things that lab does. And the next thing that we want to do is actually translate those ideas, those concepts, into something that could actually be beneficial to people like you. So we collaborate with clinicians, we collaborate with uh, people in the biotech industry and some pharma companies. Okay, and I'll just show you a few more slides about, uh, uh, about this. Um, okay, so the HIPAA pathway is involved in liver cancer, I told you, but also in many, many other types of cancers, right? So this is a good drug target. So how do we go about finding a drug to target these proteins that I told you about? And this involves a lot of chemistry. 
and, and collaboration with chemists, right? Fortunately, we know, for instance, how this protein YAP that I told you about and another partner of it, we know how they actually interact at the chemical, biochemical uh, uh, level, okay? So the idea is to actually generate small molecules, drug-like molecules, that could actually go, whoops, and bind some of these uh, proteins in the cell and inhibit their activity, inhibit their interaction, basically. Okay? So we have done this, and we've collaborated this with a, we've collaborated with a company in, in Denmark that is probably a leading in, in the way you actually find these small molecules. They basically have an, a library of about 65 million small molecules that you can actually probe and test and see which one of them actually can inhibit our target protein, which in this case is YAP and its partner TIAD. So I can tell you more about the details if you're a biologist, but I don't think you are interested. But the bottom line here is you explore basically 65 million set of potential drugs. And in the Petri dish, you can actually figure out if any of them, any of them could actually have some sort of activity. And I wouldn't tell you this story if this wasn't successful, and we have been successful. And I'll just show you two pieces of, one piece of data basically to show you that this actually works. So we found these small molecules that actually inhibit this protein. And these are, for instance, cancer cells grown in a dish, this and this. This is basically their, their, their survival. The, the lower this is, the less they survive. This is the concentration of these molecules. And this is a cancer cell line that is not driven by this gene called YAP. And these are cell lines that are fully dependent on the activity of this gene. So if we give our drugs, to these uh, 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 cells, the insensitive ones, the, cell, the drug doesn't do anything, right? So the drug is very specific only, these are three different compounds, only to the compounds, to the cells that normally require YAP for activity, okay? So we're super excited about this. These are obviously not drugs that you can actually take right now. The process from going from a lead molecule, such as these three, to a drug that you can actually take is very tedious, laborious, and expensive. So we're in the process of actually making the, these drugs better, um, uh, doing all kinds of biochemical, mechanistic studies. Uh, we want to make this better, more specific, more potent. We want to make sure they are not toxic. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, we identify the right patients that could actually benefit from this drug. So we're in the process of, you know, again, trying to license this IP or or talking to some VCs to actually start a company based on the, on, 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 on the chemical scaffolds that we've identified, okay? So hopefully in five years from now, I can tell you that we have some actually molecules that are, can, can actually be used in clinical trials for people with liver cancer. All right, so to end, um, let me tell you about some of my thoughts in terms of, of, of science in Peru. Uh, again, I, you probably, some of you guys have thought more about this than I have, but let me show you some numbers first. You guys may have seen some of this. So one way of measuring sort of a country's um, interest in basic research is to measure how much of their um, GDP, the gross domestic product, is actually invested uh, in the country's research and development. And as you can see here, we don't do quite well, right? This is a very, very low number. Brazil is doing very, very well in the past years, particularly they have a policy of investing a lot of money in research, and this is giving out, giving out very interesting results for them right now. And as you'll see in the next few slides, Chile and Argentina, historically, they've had a very good track record of actually supporting basic scientists, and this is actually uh, um, shown, okay? So we, we need to do better here, absolutely. So I think in any discussions that you participate here, or back in Peru, if you have connections, I think it's important to highlight that we are not doing very well here. I mean, we clearly have the human capital, and I think everybody here agrees on that. But there needs to be a much more uh, robust uh, strategy from the government uh, to actually uh, uh, increase investment in these areas. Um, you can also highlight the, the limitation in number of, uh, in the limitation of this in the number of scientists that we have in our country, right? And this is data from, I think, the latest Concitec census. Again, compared to other countries, right, how many researchers do we have per 1,000 people that actually work? And the number is still very, very low, okay? So this obviously needs to increase. 
And as you see, the more developed a country is typically, uh, these numbers actually go higher. So what are the outputs of research, publications, and patents? Let me show you the last two data sets. So as you can see in terms of publication, Peru does, it's also in the middle of the road to the low part of the road, okay? Again, if you look at Chile, Argentina, and Brazil, historically they've been strong. They have historically very strong policies to do this. So this needs to get better. And also in terms of patents, and this comes from a Nature article on South American science a few years ago. I mean, compared to United States, for instance, and China, in general, Latin America is not doing that great. Particularly Peru is actually on the bottom end of this. Okay? So we need to do better. So what are my final uh, takes on this? So what can we do? So number one, as I said, we need to invest more. Okay? And this needs to start from the government. But at the same time, this is not only a government process, right? I think in all successful countries, and this is a great example, Silicon Valley is a great example. You guys, some of you guys are from there. The Boston Tech Center is absolutely amazing. There needs to be also private investment, okay? But you need somewhere to start, and I think that is provided by the government in general and historically. So we need to develop a culture of entrepreneurship, right? There is a lot of ideas probably, uh, but that there needs to be pathways, there needs to be uh, programs that actually facilitate uh, uh, going from an idea to an actual uh, company or a product. And I know probably many, that's one, the re one of the reasons why you guys are actually here in the US. Uh, the government needs to support already successful programs. Okay, and I'll give you one example, this program of, of REPU that Sofia actually started a few years ago, which brings actually undergraduate students from Peru for three months summer stays here in the US to do biomedical and I, think, I believe uh, physical sciences research. I only was aware of the program about four or five years ago. And I have to tell you that if you don't know this program, this is incredibly successful. Initially, it was completely run by students, Peruvian students that were here in the US. And they've subselected a number of people that come, I think maybe 10 to 20 every year. And each one of those students does fantastically well. Okay? Many of them actually stay. Their own lab heads, people such as myself, ask them to stay for an extra year. And then those people end up staying here in the US and going to the best programs. We have one or two people here that actually go to Stanford, Harvard, that actually started in this program. But surprisingly, at least as I'm aware, there is really not much support for the government for REPU. So this structure is already established, so I think the government should actually take this, CONCITEC or whatever, and actually put a lot of uh, resources into this already successful program. The problem, though, is that these people stay here, right? Bringing back the talent is a major issue. And um, there's multiple ways to address this, but I think one potential way, and this is, you know, you can find examples, for instance, in Argentina, where they have a partnership with the Max Planck, one of the most famous institutes in, in, Germ in, in Germany, is to actually put investments, you have to make a strong investment in centers, centers of excellence, right? We know there's some good research going on at Cayetano and in other places, but I think there's gotta be individualized centers of excellence, right? Where the, the government puts a lot of money and actually maybe makes you know, a couple of these in the country where there's probably space for 20 fantastic individuals, right? That Africa would you from here and they're actually need, needed to be brought back to actually start a research program over there. So I think this will be absolutely essential. I think this will change the culture. Uh, and I think people would actually be excited, very good people from here, would actually be excited about going back and study something new and something fresh. Okay? So with that, I will end. I don't think I have anything else. And I will take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, Eduardo. Yeah, some. Uh, some questions for the audience. I think I ha we have time for two questions. If there, are, there is one person over there, anyone else that wants to ask any question, please raise your hand. Uh, hello, to Camargo. My name is Alejandro, and I'm a pharmacologist by training. I just have a couple of questions regarding your why was that, what was the reason why you added that DNA motifs into those uh, inhibitors, of those JAP inhibitors? To improve the binding, perhaps, mm -hmm. or? Why do we have the DNA motifs? Yes, in, Okay, so that, that is very specific. So the strategy that we use to actually do our screen, uh -huh. these 65 million compounds, basically, 
they're chemical compounds, but the way this library and diversity is generated is by basically putting together different uh, scaffolds of chemicals, small scaffolds. And the way that is done in catalog is you add a DNA barcode to each one of these small molecules, okay? So every small molecule in this pool, basically in suspension, is actually has a unique genetic tag which is done by the DNA barcode. This has nothing to do with uh, the DNA binding sequence of these molecules that I told you about. Okay, I these are random DNA barcodes that are simply used to actually find these molecules, right, find this, this haystack, this needle in this very big haystack. Because mm -hmm. you can actually look at this, and if whatever binds to your molecule of choice, then you can simply sequence the DNA of that tag and figure out, hey, this molecule is actually a good inhibitor for my protein. Okay, I see. Uh, can I ask another question? Yep. Yeah, well, one last question. He wants another one. So, uh, uh, so regarding the, uh, the, the role of JAP1, so what is the function with the anti-apoptotic protein? So does it inhibit them or induce them? Yeah, so JAP inhibits apoptosis, okay? Uh, so there are many mechanisms by which it does that. Uh, it transcriptionally activates many anti-apoptotic proteins. And there's some other data suggests that YAP itself could actually uh, uh, bind to other mechanisms that, uh, that, that uh, promote inhibit apoptosis. But it's clearly shown from, and the data is concerned from the fruit fly to, the, to, to our liver cancer cells, uh, there is significantly less cell death in these cells. So YAP, the, the great thing about this as a target is that it has multiple mechanisms. So apoptosis, proliferation, cell differentiation as well. And we have some other data to suggest that actually uh, the immune response right, of your, of your immune system to the tumor could actually also be regulated by YAP1 mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your presentation. It has been amazing. One round of applause for Fernand, please.